Hello, my brothers and sisters. I'm Father Remy, just for the new people. And we're going to start a new session of meditations. That's going to be called the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit. Please let me know that you are there. If you have any way to let me know that this is working, of letting me know that this is working. Okay. Okay, my friends. So, uh, I have some the outline for this conversation for this sorry for this talk and meditation. It's Patrick is gonna is gonna put it right now because I was trying right now to do it. I don't know. I was not able. I have some technological limitations. I'm sorry for that. Um. I'm going to start this with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, please send us the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life. We need to be sanctified. We need to receive the gifts of your Spirit, of your heart. Please be generous with us. Outpour all the richness of your heart. We're going to ask by the intercession of our Blessed Mother all the gifts that we need to be humble, to be sweet, to be loving. Let's pray now to the Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. And now to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, my friends. So we're going to follow the outline. Uh, if Patrick is here with us, Patrick, I sent you by WhatsApp the outline. I couldn't post it. And here we're going to follow the following. Today we're going to do a small introduction into, into the Trinity, like very small, very short. I don't want to get too deep, too complicated. And then we're going to talk about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit itself. How, why do we need them? And then we're going to go to two gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see the fear of God and the piety, the gift of piety. Okay, so first I'm going to start with a question within this introduction. What makes Jesus the most uh, beautiful fascinating, attractive, loving, peaceful, humble person on earth. What is the secret of his attractiveness, of his beauty? What is the secret of his joy? Why so people love him so much? Why he produces such an attraction? But at the same time, this shock in people. What is the secret of Jesus? Because we have never seen a human being like him. Nobody so attractive, nobody so fascinating. What is the secret? We can say the following. Do you think the secret is uh, like maybe his miracles? That's why he's so attractive. That's why he calls attention so much. So many people follow him. Do you think it's that miracle maker, miracle worker, or like his wisdom, or I don't know, his majesty over the evil spirits, his dominion over nature? What makes him so special, so attractive, so interesting? Well, the question is, the answer is the secret of his relationship. 
why he is so special for us. It's not because of his, it's all only because of his miracles or the wisdom he has, but because of the secret relationship he has inside with his father. So it's beautiful because the if he like may have done all these miracles and, and, and great deeds and wisdom, but not being a person in this relationship with the father, mm -mm. He would not have changed history. He would not have resurrected. He would not. Mm -mm. He would be just one more man, one more interesting man. So the secret of Jesus is what I want to start with. The secret of Jesus is his relationship. And what is the secret of your life? What is the secret that's going to make you a holy person, a fascinating person? The same, your relationship with God, with the Father. Uh, maybe you think, oh, my secret's going to be my intelligence. Maybe people might think, oh, yeah, my strength, my beauty, my, my wisdom at the same time. Yeah, my culture, my education. Well, Jesus will tell you the secret of everything is your relationship, is your bond, your connection. What is the secret of the church? Why the church lasted so many years, 2,000 years, being the most persecuted institution in history. Why change the Roman Empire? What is the secret in Christians? What is the secret in the miracle of the church, in the mystery of the church? Relationship. But I'm saying strictly that relationship with the Father means the secret is the experience of childhood. The spirit of childhood of God. Okay, so we have to start by that. By admiring in Jesus of Nazareth, by admiring in the saints, by admiring in the... In all, also in your own life of faith, the secret of the relationship, that you are not an orphan, okay? Why many times we're cast down? Why many times we're living as we were orphans? Like, yeah, in anguish or in loneliness or in so many, yeah, anxieties, so concerned and afraid. Why living like orphans when we truly are a secret we are like princes. We are like small kings. We have divine blood flowing in our, in our hearts. Why? The secret. Acknowledge the secret, which is something so new to this world, so shocking, so different, flowing in us, indwelling in us. You know, Jesus saying to, Nic to Nicodemus, John chapter 3, you have to be born again. You don't know where you come from. You don't know where you're going. Jesus saying this to Nicodemus. He said the same to us. You have to be born again. You have to acknowledge that you don't know where you come from. That you have to open, acknowledge your eyes, open your eyes to see that you come from the, from the same place that I am coming from. And you're heading the same. Okay, so the secret is this between. This betweenness from father a loving father towards you this bond of love okay so that's the secretness of happiness the secrets of joy is when we say relationship we're saying is a bond a unity the secret of your joy is this bond this unity the secret of the joy of jesus is this bond is unity is so powerful this bond this connection this communion that is a person the, person, the third person of the Holy Trinity. And that's what we're going to talk about. It's not you and me only. It's the us. The us. So the Holy Spirit, the main character, protagonistic of, protagonist of this conversation, of this meditation, and of the church, is the Holy Spirit. Is the communion. The person who is connection. The person who is the bridge, the connection, the bonding. Okay, it's very interesting because you know, some theologians say between the father who is the lover and the son who is the beloved, there is a person love. Between the father who is the giver and the son who is the given, is a person who is the gift. The person gift, says John Paul II. So it says that the father begets the son and stirs and contemplates the Son, and he sees in the, in the Son the fullness of his perfections, and as a reaction, he sighs, he ex exhales, and he sighs, like exhalation, 
ex expires, like the spirit come out of out of himself into the sun, as of beauty, as of delight when he sees his sons eternally. And the son, the beloved, in this sigh, in this expiration, says another expiration, pronounces another expiration. It's not a word, it's not a music, it's so beautiful that it's in the silence that is uh, produced this exhalation back to the Father saying, thank you, I love you back. That mutual exhalation, expiration, is the Holy Spirit, ex spiritus, that's the origin of the word expiration. And exhale comes from exaliento, aliento. it's the same spirit. So that's the spirit, the spirit of communion, of unity. So if you don't want just to survive, if you want to be truly alive, you have to be open to the person that connects, that produces communion. We have to be able to, this is the secret of the life of Jesus, okay? So after he gave us his example, okay? So when he was here on earth, the 33 years, talking about the Father, he was always talking about, I come from the Father, my works, my deeds, my, my words are from the Father. He was saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna promise you something greater. It's better for you. It's more convenient for you that I leave. Because somebody's coming. That one, that one who is coming is an is exhalation of the Father. That's going to indwell in us. So before in the Old Testament, we had the Father in His majesty, Yahweh. Nobody could pronounce His name. He was almighty. It was good for us that He was transcending us. Yeah, because we needed that like respect for God, that fear of God. Fear of God. But then Jesus comes and is God with us. This is Emmanuel, God close. So when people can see him in front of you, people can touch him, people can listen. The closeness, the nearness of God. Like God beside you. Before that was God invisible in the Old Testament. God invisible and very far away. And then when he lives and sends the Holy Spirit, I mean the Father and the Son both send the Holy Spirit in Pentecost in two weeks. What happens? Is that it's not God far away, it's not God just in front of me or beside me, it's God now in me. So that's why it's better for us to have Jesus by the action of the Holy Spirit. It becomes out because we become an indwelling, we become a shrine, we become a temple of God. Okay, so we're going to do and we're going to be able to do the impossible with the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised this. If you see the gospel of today, if you see the gospel in John 14, I mean, John 14 to John 16, he promises that we're going to do something synth that are greater than his. We're going to be able to see, to know, to love, not humanly, but a divine way. And that's where, what the holy gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to be able to do in us. So, master of communion, master of community, that's the essence of the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So what's going to tell you is going to, Learn, teach you how to dialogue, how to welcome, how to be empathic, how to truly understand people, okay? How to make you feel and realize that nothing that you have is yours only. Nothing is exclusive. Everything is for connection, for communion, for dialogue. Your talents, your capacity, your psychological capacities, your passions, your gifts, your creativity, your belongings, your body, but also your material things, your house. Nothing is absolutely yours. Everything is for others, for communion, to welcome people, to connect, to be compassive. That's the Holy Spirit, the personal connection of communion, okay? As the expert of the art of self-forgetfulness, of art of ecstasy, of going ex outside of yourself, ecstasis, to stay outside of yourself. That's the essence of the Holy Spirit, okay? Of openness, welcoming, and connection. Okay, what can we say about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Okay, the Holy Spirit, we can say the following. I have here a little, I was going to do a little... Mm -hmm. diagram here. So here imagine we have messy all this. Mm here -hmm. imagine we have here when our baptism we were baptized and confirmed and we receive one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven what? Seven virtues. The the three of them are the theological and the other one is the cardinal. The seven again is a number of perfection when we were baptized. And then we also receive like uh, an, an atmosphere with rich in, nut in nutrients. This atmosphere rich in nutrients are 
the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we can say, I mean, imagine these are seeds, the virtues, and this is the ground filled with the diversity of nutrients and richness, so that our virtues can flow, can grow. But what the Holy Spirit is given in the gifts are like the context, the atmosphere, so we can absorb richness. We can absorb. What's going to make the, the, the richness of this ground? It's going to make us act and think and feel in the way of God, in a divine way, not human. If we only have the virtues, it's only going to be about us, about our human effort. But if we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're going to have an inspiration, a way of acting and thinking and proceeding that is divine. Divine in what way? We're going to act according to the way of Jesus. We're going to do things that will be beyond our capacity. What's the consequence of this? We're going to live like the Beatitudes. We're going to live that Beatitudes. That kind of joy, the same Beatitudes that Jesus left. And here, what's going to be the experience of living the Beatitudes? The fruits of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So everything depends on how we are absorbing and, and obeying and being docile to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and then we proceed to act virtuously according to the, the theological and the cardinal virtues. The consequence of this is going to be a life, like a blessed life. Blessed are the meek of heart or homo. And we're going to experience a kind of joy of heaven. This kind of joy of heaven are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Living the fruits of the Holy Spirit is already living heaven on earth. Okay? We are old, empowered, we have all been endowed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The more you say yes, live in the virtues, moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the waves and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we become, the more we activate, because sometimes they lie dormant, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when we don't activate them, when we don't say yes, especially the one who unlocks the, the dormant gifts is charity. When we say yes to charity, it's like an activation. And what, we have, what happens there is an experience of heaven on earth. It's important to let you know this. Because you start thinking and feeling and receiving the love of God the Father, just like Jesus. The activation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is kind of a divine transfusion of the heart of Jesus into you. And in that moment, you feel the feelings of Jesus. You see people like, like Jesus saw them. I'm going to explain now that in the, in the gifts. So we're going to have different reactions in our faculties, the way we think, our memory, our will, and affections. All are going to be connected and identified with the faculties of, the, of Jesus. That's what the, whole, what the gifts are going to allow us to experience. But we have to say yes. I have an image. It's my, imagine you are, uh, you are a surfer. So you have to go into the point where the breaking, where the waves break, right? But you have to do the effort to get to that point, to get to that spot. And then you have to do the effort to be attentive, to see when the wave is coming. And then you have to turn and paddle strongly, attentively, so you can grab the wave. And then you're going to experience the flow. But the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit is the one that is allowing you to, boom, ride the wave and enjoy the experience. It's going to give you the speed, the beauty. You're going to be immersed in the tube. Like, and all of that is the Holy Spirit. The velocity and the energy, but you have to cooperate. You have to place yourself. So that placing yourself in position and attentive, that's the virtues. But what's going to give you all the energy to flow and to enjoy life is going to be the wave, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those waves, we don't produce them. They come. That's also interesting. The Holy Spirit, we, we, we don't say, okay, now activate a whole... No, we can decide to take a, a virtuous decision, okay, of faith, of hope, of love. But the wave itself is a gift that we don't decide. So that's why we have to ask gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, I'm going to go... Let's, let's... I'm sorry. Where are we? Okay. Mm, so this side. Where do we find the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Isaiah 11. So this is also very important. It is not an invention of the church. It's, we have to be very clear with this. One of the doctrines, one of the teachings of the church that has been the most, like, mostly in agreement by fathers of the church from the second century, third century onwards, is this, that we receive, that's like an absolute truth. And it's like, we receive the gifts of all of them, we have, which are seven, also the name of the number of perfection again. So you want to act like Jesus, you want to have the secret of Jesus, you want to be able like, to be like him, 
gift of the Holy Spirit. Something I say right now is like heaven on earth. It's important. When you are with the sanctifying grace in you, there's no difference like being on heaven. It's just a good difference in progression, in degree, but you have already heaven. It's like when you commit mortal sin, the experience is like hell. It's the same. It's a different experience of, of in, in degree, but it's the same, essentially. What is being a human being? When you realize that you're going to receive the same heart of Jesus, when you, have, when you say yes and you activate those gifts, what's the, 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 is you can say that being human is fascinating. And I want to emphasize this because many times culture says, oh, yeah, I am human. I'm human. Whenever we do something wrong and a big, big mistake, we console ourselves, oh, I'm human, which is true. We are broken. We are human. We are yeah, complicated. But what this meditation is going to highlight, please, is who we are human is incredibly magnificent. So we have to just be so fascinated with the fact that we are human because we are indwellings of God, because we, are, we have uh, divine blood flowing in us. We have the last name after our baptism. We have the last name of God. We're child of God, children of God. We also have by rights the in same inheritance of God. We're going to inherit, inherit heaven. You still have to see Romans 8. And we also have this same blood, like the same kinship. So it's fascinating. Can something be greater than this? I want to hi highlight this. So all this is just to motivate you to fall in love with the gifts, with these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the first one. In the document I shared, is like some more information about so, can fear of God, can God be feared? That's the same first question I want to ask you. Can God be feared? Mm -hmm. Like, should he or could somebody who is absolutely goodness and absolute love be feared? It is like it's correct to do that. And it's possible to be afraid of somebody who is absolute goodness and beauty and gentleness and sweetness and mercy. Well, what's the answer? What do you think? I think yes and no. Yeah, it's not absolute yes, it's not absolute no. It's combo. Why? Why do we can and should and might fear God? Because not because of Him, because He's perfect goodness, kindness, and beauty, and humble and humility, but because of us, because of our sins, because of our disobediences, because we're not holy. So in that sense, because of the fear of the consequences of our sins, some like traditionally was called like chastisements for our sins, uh, we should be afraid because, okay, that's true. Because of his absolute just, his absolute truth, truth and, and just and fairness, I should be afraid in that sense. But at the same time, and that's the balance, there's mercy and he's outpouring mercy and he's seeking to like immerse us in his mercy. So that's so good news because that gives a balance because the, con the, the, the after the connection of these two constructs, his justice and the mercy, the infinite mercy that is pouring out on us is that we should be careful. We should be aware. We should be vigilant and not afraid, not paralyzed. So it's very important because these, this reality of contemplating the just God and the mercy it's going to lead us to the beautiful balance. It's going to be the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be acknowledging the correct understanding of both. It's going to give the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do we see in people who are not believers? What do we see in people who don't have prayer life, who don't connect and have enough faith and love of God? That the fact of justice, that the fact of fear of God, of running away from Him, is much harder. They don't want to talk about God. They don't want you to talk to with, about God with them, they just, oh, this rejection and hate about God because they are lacking the understanding of mercy. Because only by faith they connect to mercy. But by an instinct, a natural instinct, they can feel that God exists and they can feel dirty or they can feel guilty. So it's more of the fallen nature to be able to feel the unfairness and the fear and the bad fear, the wrong fear. But it's through some connection, some surrender into faith that we discover mercy. And then the holy, the gift of fear of God gets into our heart. Okay? And it becomes attentiveness, sobriety, 
vigilance, awareness. That's going to be the essence of these. I'm going to describe it a little bit more. Okay, so we need this connection. I'm going to say the kinds of fear that we have. Uh, yeah, so, so we have, first I'm going to describe the kinds of unholy fear, the kinds of fear that are not imbued by divinity, by the, the, by the gift. Okay, so that's the fear of God that we're going to see in Adam and Eve. Okay, you see God, you listen to God, you have an intuition of God that is around here, that he can see you, that he is not. Ah, hide, flee from God. Flee, rejection. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have it in my mind. Beam. Adam and Eve reaction. Another one, John Paul II says, is the wicked servant. You have the parable of the talents. And one of them buries his talent. The responsibility, the fact of being called and being having in responsibility before God, like having to answer to God, shocks that guy and paralyzes, is a paralyzing fear and buries his talents. That's the kind of unholy fear, okay? And many say it's like, uh, they're like, there are levels on this unholy fear because one of them can be a person who is just, I don't care. I just prefer the world than God. I prefer the fear of, of losing stuff like my reputation, my food, whatever, before God. That's the most low kind of fear. Uh, and then it's more a servile fear of God. Like, okay, I, I, I believe some stuff and I practice some religiosity, but... But if there's no chastisement, no bad consequences for me, I would not believe at all. Both are, ugh, but there's a degree within them. Then we have the threshold. What is the threshold into the holy fear? And that's very interesting. It is the experience of void, of emptiness. After you have been slaved by idols of this world, let's say pleasures, richness, reputation, living for the appearances, for vanities, and then you experience your misery because you realize your emptiness, your inner void, your sadness, your mediocrity. You experience this horror for your own mediocrity. You say, ah, oh, you, you realize this is not me. I am a slave of things, of stuff. Like St. Francis had a dream saying, in a dream before his conversion, God told him, ask him, what do you want, to serve me, the Lord, or to serve the servants? And like many quest, many times the question, to serve lo the Lord or to serve the servants, the little stuff, the things on earth, what do you want to be slave to? So that awareness is a frustration and that's the threshold into the healthy fear of God because you reject that kind of misery that you acknowledge. That's experience of the prodigal son when he comes into his senses, okay? So that in itself, if you see that in people, if you see that in yourself, beauty the threshold into the correct into the correct fear of God. Uh, what is this? What can we say about the fear of God as a gift? It always has to be, has to have the soul of love. Okay? Every, because it's the spirit of love. It's the spirit of connection. So to realize, to ask yourself, if you have the spirit of God active, if you have in, you're in a mood when you're taken, you're possessed by the spirit of fear of God, you have to realize if you are being drawn into God has to be a connection of love. So it's paradoxical the name fear we're emphasizing, right? There are two kinds. One is not, and it's like the, the, the uh, harmful one. And this is the one who is gift, is, has in its core love and connection. Okay? So what, what are we going to see? We're going to see like um, John Paul II saying this. It is a sincere and reverent, reverential feeling that a person experiences before the tremendous majesty of God. Okay, so when we reflect upon his infidelity and the danger of being found wanting at the eternal judgment that no one can escape, the believer goes and places himself before God with a contrite spirit and a humble heart, like Psalm 50. So he goes, he's drawn by this energy. I'm going to see the energy, but not a thing. It's a person, the Holy Spirit. It's moving you to fall on your knees in front of, of, of God, of this majesty. It's a sense of his greatness and his majesty. Psalm 50. Knowing well that he must await his own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? Fear and trembling, says Philippians, said St. Paul to the Philippians. That is holiness. It's, that is from the Spirit. That is not bad to expect it in fear and trembling, okay? 
That doesn't mean it's an irrational fear. Irrational fear is the other one, the harmful one. So it's imbued with a sense of responsibility, like you say, yes, I will answer, and I follow my needs. But there are different kinds of levels and de degrees in this. It, one of them can be the little daughter of, of like, sees God like his father and says, I'm gonna, and clings on him and loves him, which is beautiful. But at the same time says to him, I'm afraid that you can separate from me. That is mm -mm, imperfect, but it's, it's already a gift because it's because of love that you don't want to sin and go away. But at the same time, it's, it's because of me, I am afraid what is going to happen with me, my, uh, my sufferings, my consequences, my chastisement, if I, if, if, if I fall away from you. Imperfect. What would be the perfect kind of fear of God? It's like you go and grab him like a loving and cling and obedient into the Father. And you say to him, even if there is no heaven afterwards, I will love you anyway. I love you because you are beautiful. You are the source of my joy. You are so beautiful, my father. And he can and also say, even if there's no hell, I will fear you. Because is I will fear to offend you. I will fear to make you sad. That's why I cling, hold fastly to you. I love you so much. I will fear to sadden you. It's not I will fear that what will happen with me. So that's the perfect fear of God that Jesus had. Okay? Is that he doesn't he never wanted to make his father sad. He knew he was the perfect delight of the father and the joy of the father. So when we're talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, is the heart of Jesus, the dispositions of the heart of Jesus, the inspirations in us. So that's the kind of fear of God, the healthy one. Okay, so this, but arriving to this point starts with this sense of reverence in front of his majesty, of his power, of his immensity that makes you detest and reject immediately the, uh, the, the sins, okay? Okay, so it's important, it's Genesis 3, 8 to see the bad one, Matthew 25 to see the wicked servant. What can we say about the, mm, okay, some examples of this holy fear also in the gospel. We have first our blessed mother, oh, when she was asked by the, by the by the Archangel Gabriel, what was her answer? She was deeply troubled, but was not paralyzed. Troubled, tempered, like um, moderated, with trust, with the sense of his sweetness, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. The piety of the the gift of piety is going to uh, how do you say this? Like uh, mitigate the trepidation. Of the majesty of God is going to be mitigated by the piety, by the gift of piety. That's why the Blessed Mother, though, though he was triply, though so deeply troubled, she trusts and says yes to everything. Okay, it's mitigated by always, by the mercy, the divine mercy. That's why it's so important the devotion to the divine mercy, Jesus. Because we come out of the natural fear of an, of our sins, sense of just only God, God who is only just into the contact with, with piety, through the context of, uh, of divine mercy. What are going to be the effects of this? The effects of having this fear of God? It's going to be the sense of His majesty. Isaiah number 6, we see the vocation of Isaiah when he has this vision of the, art of the seraphims of God that are covering their, their faces before God and singing, holy, holy, holy. They're singing with their faces covered and in a position of reverence. They cannot see God, the, the seraphims. And Isaiah says, I am lost. I am a man of impure lips. I am lost in front of God. Who can save me? And then he sees one of the seraphims coming and purifying his mouth with a chark, with a coal on fire. So that's experience. Or also Peter, when he, when Jesus gets into his boat and he has a miraculous fishing and he falls on his knees and says, get away from me because I'm a poor sinner. That's experience of that sense of majesty, of wonder. Okay, we have, to, we need that. Those are, those are the healthy effects of the, of, the, of the fear of God. And, but also we have this seal for it and we desire to, like, to be vigilant, attentive. Like when Jesus says to in, in Gethsemane, be, village, be vigilant, watch and pray so we will not fall. So that's the second effect. So first of all, sense of majesty. Sense, secondly, this, this vigilant and sober, watchful, prayerful attitude like Jesus. And then the third one is like this rejection for sin. Like I, 
I hate sin. That's healthy. And to saying this to you is very important for you to have this hate for sin. Uh, it's not like, oh, okay, I like some vanity, I like some, some, yeah, some lust sometimes. It's human. Uh-uh, that's not human. Human is glorious. Human is heaven on earth. Human is being like Jesus. That's be truly human, okay? So like Jesus, when he goes into the temple, when do we see the fear of God in Jesus? When he goes into the temple and cleanses the temple from the merchants. That fire, do not contaminate my father. The seal for my father's house consumes me. And who is the father's house? It's you. You are the temple and the house of the father. The seal for your own, the respect for your own soul as the father's shrine. So we need that, those three effects of, of okay. So some means. Mm. Okay, lastly, some means. Ask for the gift. It's a gift, so you have to be asked. But you have to work to be in the position so you can catch the wave. So you have to reflect on His majesty and power. Reflect on the immensity. Reflect on creation, the power, and the universe. And who are you? Your littleness, your nothingness. And third, acknowledge your own uh, vigilance or lack of vigilance. Acknowledge your own path into sin. How much you accept and you dialogue with sins. And acknowledge how do you feel when you follow and you accept sin. Acknowledge that frustration, that misery that comes sometimes comes into your heart because you see yourself so mediocre. Have this horror for mediocrity. And then I'm going to ask you a, a homework afterwards, okay, about this. I want you to choose one of these means one of these effects, choose one, meditate on it, and then share it with someone else in this chat. Okay, next with, uh, please remind me about the homework at the end. We go to the piety, the gift of piety is going to mitigate, as I was saying, it's going to mitigate, it's going to give a balance to all these. And the gift of piety, what says John Paul II? It directs and nourishes such need. Enriching it with sentiments of profound confidence in God. So you need, you experience the, the need of, of, you fall on your knees, but it, and, and then Jesus, like Peter falling on his knees in front of, of Jesus, and saying, get away from me. And what's the reaction of Jesus? Do not be afraid. Do not have the kind of fear of Adam and Eve. Do not have the fear of the wicked servant. I am not something bad for you. I have a present for you, which is mercy. Do not be afraid. I believe in you. I love you. I am not scandalized by your sins. From now on, you will become a fisher of men. Whoa. That's the introduction into the gift of piety because it has to do with the connection with the supernatural gift of mercy. Okay? Experience the mercy, the sweetness. So... Piety is going to be seeing God not only as the majestic, sovereign, and creator and master of the world, but as a father. So what it introduces into our heart is a sense of family. is the sense of family, of being with God, of being a child of God. You're no longer trying to reject and run away from Him. Okay, So you see Father as your loving Father. You experience a, a sense of trust, of confidence, of sweet affection towards the Father. You know, St. Therese of Lisieux, she was found many times when she was working on her, on, in her cell, like sewing or doing stuff. She was found crying, and people and other nuns ask, why are you crying? And she said, yeah, but why are you crying? Don't worry. What is, why, what is happening? And she says, I was meditating on the Our Father. She was found crying because only because she was meditating on the words of the Our Father. How beautiful it is to be a child of God. She was immersed. She is recognized especially for this gift, living the gift of piety. St. Teresa of Lisieux, if you want to meditate on that and balance the sense of the, 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 uh, the harmful fear, St. Teresa of Lisieux, so important. And as Fa and Faustina, like right, the, the apostle of divine mercy. So sentiments of profound confidence in God, trusted, trusted as a good and generous father. And St. Paul says in this sense, God sent his son that we might receive adoption, the spirit of adoption, as proof that you are children of God. Send the spirit of his son into our hearts. 
the spirit of his son, of sonship, okay? Crying out, Abba, Father, Abba, which means Daddy, is the expression of a little kid, okay? Eight-year-old kid, Hebrew, called his father Abba, okay? How did Jesus call his father? Abba. Always, even on the cross, even in the word on Garden of Gethsemane, even in the moment of pain and sorrow, when he can feel like humanly, he feels lonely because he has been re betrayed and rejected. But in the depth of his spirit, in the depth of his core, he knows he's a beloved child and he feels the closeness and the nearness of the unconditional love of his father. He knows he's the delight and the joy of the father. And he says, Abba. Okay, that's the experience. Romans 8, 15 to 16. Beautiful if you can meditate on these. I'm going to ask you one homework related to the fear of God and one homework related to piety. Can be meditating on one of the aspects and one of the effects and one of the means. So, what's the root? Okay, what fosters and why? What is underlying this piety? Great gratefulness or gratitude. I don't know how to say it better. Gratitude. Okay, what do we find in Jesus in the heart of Jesus? Gratitude. What is the word that always comes from the mouth of Jesus? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. He's always saying that. I don't know if you have realized. You can go to Luke chapter 10, verse 21. You can go to the resurrection of Lazarus. Thank you, Father. You are always with me. And then he does a miracle. You can go to the institution of the Eucharist. And taking bread, giving thanks, bless it, broke it and gave it. He's always saying thank you. So having this piety imbued with gratitude is having emotion of the heart of jesus in you you have it be joyful because that's being human not falling and again no that is being truly and gloriously yourself gratitude what are the effects of this piety filial tenderness being delighted on being on your father saying abba falling on okay filial tenderness an adoration for the divine fatherhood. Adoration for the divine fatherhood. That you like just to meditate how Jesus loves his father. It's the divine fatherhood means not the adopted fatherhood that we have, but you contemplate in the Trinity how Jesus, the Son, is being so immersed in this peace and serenity and joy on the, in the bosom of his eternal father. And you see that? When he goes every morning to pray, when he comes back for praying, splendors and shining, when he is in the Last Supper, John 17, in the bosom of the Father, Father, just speaking to the Father, you are with me always, I love you. Just adore That's that connection. That is an effect of piety in you. Cultivate it, try to do it so you can be ready for the wave. A third effect is the abandonment of your life, of your future, of your present moment on the Father's hands, on the Father's arms. Abandonment. Piety leads to abandonment. Another consequence is the feeling of, of loving your neighbor as a sibling, as a brother or a son, or a brother or, 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 or a sister in God. So it's beautiful because you have that in, in St. Francis of Assisi, for example. He sees the most miserable person, the most miserable sinner, as his brother and daughter, and he loves them so much. And that, that's, that, that's so powerful, I want to tell you. Like it's a connection, a deep connection with every human being because of the blessed experience, awareness of the filial adoption, of, of divine blood flowing in you as a gift of that, okay? As a gift, you see the gift of the person. And then a fourth effect of this is you see creation as also the house of the Father. And that's in Francis of Assisi, like hugging trees and loving them and saying, Sister Moon and, and the Brother Sun and, and Sister Death even, like everything in the cosmos, everything has been redeemed. Everything is the house of the Father. Everything, the cosmos and creation is my home. My home, where I belong. It's beautiful. There's a, it's like you see a connection between creation and the new creation in heaven. And he feels in home. That's a pious person. St. Francis of Assisi, beautiful. Um, some means for this, okay, to grow in piety. 
gratitude. It's like every day. Write down. Just like a good mean for the fear of God is uh, examine of, examination of conscience. So we can always remain and re aware of our sins and temptations and reject them. Here is a list of the gifts, natural and supernatural gifts that you receive daily. You can do that every day. Maybe two, three gifts, because it cannot make, not too long. But the gifts, experience, that will foster, that will open the door to the, whoo, to the wind, to this blow of the heart of Jesus, the pious of Jesus coming into you. Second mean, fraternal love. Go beyond the fraternal love that you usually give. Go beyond this and, and yeah, do it strongly. Uh, you can meditate on Philippians 4 1. It's beautiful how he calls the Philippians, my beloved and greatly desired brothers, my joy and my crown. Okay, we should have that attitude for eternal love. Okay, and having a love for all that is sacred. That's also something. Cultivate your filial love with Mary. Your love for the saints, your love for the souls of purgatory, your love for the Pope, the sweet Jesus on earth, like Catherine of Siena called him, the love for priests. Yeah, pray for the priests. Your love for everybody. So you cultivate this through the sense of family, everything that cultivates and fosters this sense of family, okay? What is the opposite, and you have to be aware of, the opposite attitude of this piety is uh, uh, being ungrateful. Being ungrateful and being hard of heart, not forgiven, okay? Because somebody who is pious is aware of the everything is a gift and is forgiven. Pardons, which means I forgive. I give back the gift and it's merciful, okay? So be aware. Homework, take one of the effects or means of the fear of God and meditate on it. Take one of the effects or means of, of the piety, meditate on it, reflect, make a list, can be a list of, of things you are grateful for, meditate, how, how are you living these, these two uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit? And then, the second part of the homework for next week, look for somebody who is taking this, who has seen this video, who has seen this reflection and meditation, and talk about it and share. Okay, I see myself with these like, this kind of fear, the un unhealthy fear. But I also see myself with this kind of piety and trust and desire for divine mercy, whatever. Sure. Okay, what do you see in your soul? What did you see in the, uh, what, what do you see of the presence of the gifts and how do you would like to activate them? Have this conversation and we, we're gonna meet next week. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna see if you have any questions or comments, we're good. Oh yeah. Yeah, along this, this meditation, if you have questions, please write them down and we can share. God bless you, my friends. I'm giving you some time. No time. Okay. God bless you very much. Ask for the gifts. When you do your homework, ask for the gift of fear of God. Ask for the gift of piety. Knowing that it's, the wave is going to come. It's going to be activated. It lies dormant in your heart, but it's going to boom. It's going to activate it. Through asking, ask and you will receive, said Jesus. Ask, ask, the Holy Spirit, ask. And then um, ask and remember, charity is the unlocks. Charity is the essence to unlock all this. May Almighty God bless you, my friends. The Father and the Consoler, the Spirit of love. And, sorry, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Consoler the spirit of truth, the spirit of joy. Remain, descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Bye-bye and see you.